right, everybody. Welcome to our February Arcadia Book Book Club. We're going to discuss The Sentence by Louise Erdrich, a book that every bookseller and um, at Arcadia absolutely loved. And I think many of you will say the same. We've sold a whole lot of these books because we just keep telling everybody they need to read this book. So there are quite a few of us tonight, which is wonderful for our discussion. So I think maybe this week um, or this month, we will ask you to push the, um, click the raise your hand button, and then we'll unmute you, I'll unmute you, and you can ask your questions just because there are so many of us, we might talk over each other. So that said, to Mr. Bonin. Oh God, okay. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for being here. Um, before, I, uh, before I forget, I, I want to tell you that I, I watched a, uh, an interview with Louise Erdrich tonight from the, um, that was done at the Newbury Library uh, in Chicago about six or seven weeks ago. And it's, it's really wonderful. You should, you should uh, try to get it on YouTube. Um, the, the introduction to it, not the guy who's from the Newbury Library, but the indigenous poet and, and writer who, who introduces the, the, the two women. It, it's, it's, it's just an absolutely astonishing introduction. Uh, so powerful, in fact, that Louise Erdrich said, I think I have to have a couple of minutes of not speaking. I, I feel like I should go in a corner and cry. I mean, it was just unreal. But anyway, I, I uh, oh, how do we, uh, Allison just said, how do we raise our hand? This is how we'd raise our hand. We do, I don't know, how do you raise your hand? Nancy? Uh, uh, wait, I know this. Uh, <laughs> <you go. laughs> on my iPad, it says more, there's three dots. You click on the three dots and then there's a the yellow hand that you click on, it says raise hand. Yes. yes. Okay. That's it. Well, well, maybe if no one else shows up, we can just do without that, but we'll see. Um, anyway, that was really, that was. Um, okay. So it's good to know that not only booksellers uh, love this book, but uh, it, it's, and there's so much in it to talk about that, I, that I'm, I'm really going to say next to nothing and then just try to to, um, to launch in and see what people think. But, but I, I, I did feel like saying that the, the character of Tuki and the way, the, you know, the, the character is so complicated. And, uh, and, and, and one of the things that, that Louise said in this interview was that she, she couldn't really, she, she didn't really know where that, where Tookie's voice came from in her head, in her imagination, but that she had for, for a long time had had that, that this, the first sentence of the book uh, uh, written down on a piece of paper, while in prison, I received a dictionary. And um, she did uh, reveal that she had actually gotten that dictionary from the National Football League when she was uh, you know, 15 or something. Um, so it was quite funny, but uh, and, and and then it turned out that the the younger woman who was interviewing her had a later edition of the same dictionary, you know, and so they were just kind of astonished by that. It was really fun, um, but but she did say that that you know because she'd never tried to write a book in real time before, and it was and when she started into that writing in real time, it it scared her a lot. And then when the, when the pandemic started, <laughs> this is, you know, before everything else that happened in Minneapolis, you know, she just thought, okay, all I'm going to try to do is get my characters through whatever happens. And I'm just going to stay focused on the characters and just let them react in real time in my head as I'm reacting in real time in my head uh, and just hope that that will, will get me through. Um, and it just, um, it, it really made me realize how 
you know, how, how hearing all of the events, not just in the bookstore and the ghost story, but all the events that were actually happening in Minneapolis, refracted through the eyes of these terrific characters and particularly Tookie who had such a complicated past. Um, I th it just made, it made this, what was happening, which we were all reliving, you know, very quickly after it had happened in real time, it, it made it somehow accessible in a different way. And kind of, in, in a sense, it helped me kind of go back and replay the tape of my own life in that year and, and kind of compare and contrast some of the things that I was feeling or experiencing with, with, these, with these wonderful characters. And, um, and then one of the questions that she asked, and maybe this, you know, is, because um, you know, this is in relation both to the ghost and to many of the other events in the book, but one of the questions that was sort of haunting her, she said, was, you know, how much do we owe to the dead? And whether that means the ghost in the story or whether it means the ghosts of all the people you know, in the, you know, who've had terrible things happen to them in America, not just in Minneapolis, but, you know, on reservations and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it just, uh, there's so many provocative things. And I have a, a little quote I want to read later, but I'm going to hold off until see what, what comes up. But, but so um, I'll just ask one thing. So what, what did people, how did people react to, Tookie and knowing, you know, right off the bat that she'd done this odd, in my opinion, sort of accidental crime uh, and seemed to be punished uh, outlandishly for, for the crime. Um, not that transporting drugs is, is something um, that isn't serious, but in her situation, which was an act of love, with no knowledge of the drugs, it felt um, to be sentenced to 60 years um, seemed just perverse and, and, and hateful. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm shutting up. Wait, is that Corinne? Oh my God, hi Corinne. <laughs> wow, I owe you an email. Ah! Okay, sorry. That's why I'm here. Okay, yeah, that's that. what I think. You, wanted, you wanted to make sure I was still on Earth. No, I just I just read this book, and then I, and then I got the that I bought from you guys, and then I um, saw the email, so I had to be here. Well, welcome. That's great. Wonderful. Thanks. Bye. Okay, Corinne's in Los Angeles. Okay, and we've known each other since she was about six. Well, not really, but seventeen or something. Um, and she's probably now nineteen. Uh, okay. Uh, comments, thoughts, Tookie, no Tookie? Hello? Okay. Yes. Diane, do you want to talk? There we go. I was trying to unmute and it wasn't working. Um, I, um, at first, when I first started it, she was so odd. I kind of was a little bit um, put off. And I thought, mm, I don't know if I'm going to like this. She's just kind of not a very likable character um, at the beginning. And then, you know, as I got into it, um, you know, she became super likable and, um, and hilariously funny, which I didn't expect from at the beginning. You know, I didn't expect that this book, I, I thought the book was going to be really interesting because of the whole bookstore aspect and the ghost and everything. I didn't realize how funny it was going to be. Um, and I have to admit, though, I haven't quite finished because I got too distracted with the Olympics. But um, but I'm just but I'm really loving it. Um, <laughs> she's just a fascinating, like you said, very very complex, interesting. But but I'm at page two forty nine. But she's become a very lovable character. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, other other responses. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm see, I love all of the flaws, the sloppiness of her, and her her anger, you know, she's kind of ironic and skeptical and, and boy, but she has fierce anger though. It's really potent. It's kind of Louise's thing. She can yeah. write these very serious topics like the roundhouse is about a sexual assault and 
I, I would laugh out loud. I mean, some of her other characters in that book are just fabulous. So, right. right. Larry, do you want to speak? Um, my blurb for book club is the sentence is the Hamnet of 2022, which is the highest compliment I can give the book. I'd like to read a short quote from page 78, which I think epitomizes how wonderful the book is. My lucky gene to ancestor may have bequeathed to me this resilience. At the same time, losing everyone you love is obliterating. And some believe that trauma changes a person genetically. I don't know if that's possible, but if it is, along with the rude good health I have, an inherited sense of oblivion. And that, uh, my favorite word that James Joyce invented is joko serious. This is really a joko serious. It's so funny, yet it's so serious. And the writing during the last two years, it made me realize that years from now, people who weren't alive are gonna not believe what we've all lived through the last two years. It, when you read it, it's like, did this all really happen? And sadly, yes, the answer is yes. And now we're at a point where the people who don't care about George Floyd or Black Lives Matter or protecting others for, for the pandemic, uh, at least in our local elections, uh, are defeating good school board members and uh, things are not looking good for uh, the side of justice. But I'm very interested to hear Nancy and Jim's reaction to the bookstore in a time of a pandemic because she captured what I thought it would be like, but I have no idea. And of course, we're going to want to know if there's a ghost at Arcadia. Okay. Natalie, you should unmute yourself. Natalie is my fellow bookseller and BFF. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was crazy. And we knew it was serious when Wisconsin closed down on March 17th, you know, for from Wisconsin to close down the bars on St. Patrick's Day. And I just, I remember walking out of the store that day and just not knowing when we were gonna come back because we were kind of told that you're not supposed to be in your business unless you're in a central business. So we would have our meetings outside and on the phone with each other. And um, then we just started <laughs> sending, we, we came back, maybe we weren't supposed to, but we did come back in and we started to um, ship out books and books and books. And there was a quandary in there, Natalie can speak to that about if we're sending these books, that means that we're asking the post office or the or the publishers or the book suppliers that then they have to work. Is that, you know, is that wrong for us to be putting, having other people go to work? Um, but um, when we when we got into it, thank God we have um, a really great website and that it was up, up and running years before this happened because that's what saved us. That's what saved us in 2020 is that all of you just started ordering books, ordering books. And every flat surface in the store was stacked with books. You know, we're waiting for, to complete somebody's order. And we just, there was just paper flying. You know, we're cutting up all these mailing labels and we're racing to the post office, trying to get there between by 4.15. And it was wild. It was wild. And the phone just rang off the hook constantly. And, and at the beginning, We'd only be in here one at a time or just one of us upstairs and one of us downstairs. And we had our phones labeled with our names and our pens and no, we didn't touch anything. We would never share it anything. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you think, Matt? It makes me emotional hearing this from you, by the way. Uh, um. but, and then when we reopened in May of 2020, it was it was kind of like nerve rattling a little bit because I don't know it, it was almost like it was our first day open again our very first day so 
Yeah. I mean, we've as I see Barb as a customer who would come out, you know, we'd package up her book orders and we'd hang it outside of the front door so she could get all of the books she wanted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had the cart and everybody's books lined up. They'd call us and tell us what time they were coming. So we'd run out there and put them back and just wave, wave from inside. Yeah, I know it was hard. It we, was. Did, we did a lot of deliveries too. Um, yeah. And my favorite one was when I got into some the car with five books for someone and dropped my cup of tea into the bag where the books were. So four of the five books had to be uh, thrown out, uh, you know, but they, they, they understood and we got them other copies and, you know, but yeah, uh, but Larry, to answer your question specifically there, I bet there are 20 places in the book where I made notes saying that's exactly what happened to us, or that's exactly what we did, or that's the same solution we came to. You know, we just talked and talked and talked about how to do things safely and how to, you know, because we did think of ourselves, frankly, as, I mean, even though many people wouldn't, as an, as an essential business slash service, because people were just stuck at home. They needed, they needed something, you know. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. So that's, but that's an answer. That's a shortish answer to the question, but yeah, it was, it was harrowing and fascinating. And, and, and we're still of, talking about how to do things properly. And right. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, there's another hand up. Uh, oh, uh, but, but I, I've never come across a ghost. Even, no. oh, even here oh, by oh. myself at night, like I am right now, no ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Barb, do you want to say something? Barb Jenkins? Yes, um, I guess I'd like to comment on the title of the book. Um, there's several points, as, as I read through the book, the first part where the a sentence came up, it was, and I didn't mark what page it was on, but it said, I was sentenced to be a white person. And I thought, yeah, these indigenous people were forced to go to these Indian schools to become white. And so I thought, okay, that's like, that's what the book's about, or that's what the sentence, the title of the book refers to. Then as I read further, much further on, when George Floyd was killed, then it said, you know, the sentence that was, spoken around the world, I can't breathe. And then I thought, well, that's, that's what the title refers to. And then she found that sentence in the book that she buried, but she didn't tell us what it said, not right away. And I'm like, okay, that's what, so, <laughs> you know, the title is like, how, how did that, the title fit into the book? And it fit in, you know, it came up in many different you know, places. Um, so I, I'd noticed that. And, um, and then, you know, in the end, it was revealed what was in the book. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that, that, uh, well, and I would, you know, that I noticed that as I read. The other thing I want to comment is I'm, I'm not sure how the cover of the cover of the book fits it's anything. Um, it's certainly not, in my opinion, Native American um, motifs or anything. So I'm just curious why this cover was chosen for the, well, at least for the um, hard copy of the book. So that's my comments for now. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, you know, it does have some of the beadwork in a couple of the mm -hmm. triangles. Oh, I see. It's it is beads. Okay, I didn't pick up on that. Okay. Yeah, she's so clever, but the way she uses the word sentence in myriad ways. Yeah. Um. So, well, that's actually if if I can just intrude for one second about uh, because it, with the quote that I was gonna that I mentioned before because one of the things that I love about the book is how she brings in history 
but in such a kind of uh, quiet or sometimes um, sneaky in the just the right way ways. But but uh, I have a, a pre-publication, but so my page numbers are probably not right. So I probably won't I won't give the the page numbers. But in this this is early in the book, and she she talks uh, about how the you know she she's already mentioned the 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 dictionary and mentioning the word sentence. She's just about to mention the word sentence and how the definition of the sentence, of course. With the with the with the two sentences using a sentence are at the end are so are so brilliant, uh, which if, if you don't remember those two sentences are the door is open and go, are the are the sentences which were actually the sentences in that I checked were the you know the sentences in the American Heritage book, but just before that, she she talks about. Um, about how she also, in addition to falling in love with language and reading and reading, she was also a statistics buff. And she says, I was on the wrong side of the statistics. Native Americans are the most over-sentenced people currently imprisoned. I love statistics because they place what happens to a scrap of humanity like me on a worldwide scale. For instance, Minnesota alone imprisons three times as many women as all of Canada, not to mention all of Europe. There are other statistics. I can't even get into those. For many years now, I've asked myself, why are we at the bottom or at the highest worst of everything measurable? Uh, because I know we have greatness as a people, but perhaps our greatness lies in what isn't measurable. And I mean, if you just sort of study the way that, that she moves through those sentences, it's, I just think it's extraordinary. But the, but the great thing about it is I love statistics because they place what happens to a scrap of humanity like me on a word, worldwide scale. And, it, and, and it's, it's what she talked about before. You know, Louise Erdrich was talking about in this interview I saw, it was just how everything is personal through the eyes of Tookie. And yet that, that can bring in all of the world because Tookie is experiencing it or has experienced it. And she's carrying kind of the guilt, uh, you know, her own guilt about what she did and uh, the dead people that are in her life and the, the ghost that seems to be haunting her in particular. Um, and I thought that was unbelievably clever too of, of Erdrich to, to make the ghost as opposed to you know so many stories where the Indian, the indigenous person is the ghost in haunting somebody. But in this case, it's a white woman who wanted to be an indigenous person. And I just thought that was really, it just opened up so many doors that we otherwise wouldn't think about. Um, so, okay. Comments? All right. Okay, so because I have the moderator screen, I'm sorry, I can't tell you for sure where everybody's raise your hand button is. So if you can't find yours, just wave your hand wildly and I will look for you. <laughs> oh, I see. So we can just use our hands, okay. Yes, you can okay. just wave. Um, so, No, I have. Uh, I don't want to just call anybody out, but Allison, do you have any? <laughs> oh, Pat McCorkle, did you want to say Hello? something? No, I'm just here. Oh, okay. It's, it's been a crazy day. Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh, there we go. Kareen wants to say something. Okay. <laughs> I was just say this is this is kind of when I was reading it. This is um, there's there's a lot of kind of inside baseball here. It's like a book lover's book, too. And I found myself when they would talk about different titles and different authors. If if I hadn't read that book, I I found my I was making a list, not knowing 
at the end of the book <laughs> does that for you. Did anybody else do that? <laughs> like I shared, I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta check that one out. I gotta check this out. And then at the end of the book, I'm like, oh, she did that for me. That was nice. Um, Amazing list. Yeah, I love that. It was, yeah, but it was Tookie's list, you know. It was, it was the, Tookie's list, but you know. Was, was so great. Um, and I'm a little ashamed by um, how many of them I have not read. So. Um, uh, anyway, I thought that that was something that I have like in my margins. I'm like, oh, this, that, and the other thing. Got to order these. Um, uh, I I love the uh, the customer um, disappointed. Is that oh. what that is? dissatisfaction? Dissatisfaction. That's it. Dissatisfaction. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's there are a few of those characters that seem like they're just these small little anecdotes here and there, but then that turns into that beautiful, um, there's like that beautiful vignette where the, the dog, the ghost dog, come mm -hmm. you know, comes and she goes to the house and he's and and that that idea that um, the dog the dog died for him, yeah, you know that that uh, so. It, it, it's and then and the, I don't, I'm not being very articulate, but it seems like there are, there are several point, points in the book where where people are um, you know couples and um, uh, Tuki and her husband, for instance, him getting COVID and her not getting COVID and her being in the car, and it seems like there there are all these places where. Um, uh, loved ones are, you know, death and loved ones are uh, bumping up against each other and, mm -hmm. and uh, in different ways. And I, I thought that, that that was particularly beautiful scene where she goes to the house and, and uh, is asking after him and, and how, and, and how they're caring for people you know, their customers and their people in these, in these loving little ways, like even the people who, who maybe irritate them, <laughs> you know, um, uh, it, it's, it's some, some of the beauty and there's all these horrible things happening. And then there's so many people looking out for each other and, and her relation, Chucky's relationship with her stepdaughter, I think is one of the, the high, was one of the highlights, I think. And, and the reaction she had to the baby and the connection she made with the baby and and uh, then learning later about all the trauma that Tuki had as a as a child herself and you know of course she couldn't connect to her stepdaughter before of course she's going to have issues with this and um, but she, yeah she's just such a a complicated messy terrific character and uh, going to be hard to forget her yeah, well, and that's another way, you know, kind of the I, that, I, I love all that, Corinne. That, uh, but the the whole idea of, of how books haunt you too, you know, the books that that stay with you year after year, and you keep thinking about them, and you can't quite shake them. Um, yeah, there's just there's so many layers to so many of the things that she's bringing. But yeah, the, the relationships I agree with you are, are very complicated, and you know sometimes you're just cringing, thinking, "Oh God, you know that's that that person's acting as badly as I acted in that." You know, I mean, you know, I mean, that how horrifying is that? You know, it's just, um, and but yet they're somewhere they come back to you know kind of loving and forgiving, and that's that's really great. Um, I just happened to notice I had the book open to the to the scene where she gets arrested, uh, which is just hilarious. The scene in the in the diner, which which he says uh, he says though also, and then he was going to amend, but I butted in. Only you became a tribal cop. Wise choice. You could be anything, said Pollux. You make my brain boil. You make my heart, he delicately touched his chest, flip over, twist in a knot. It's like you never learned that our choices get us where we are. I mean, wow. <laughs> the truer words were never spoken, but I could not respond. My thoughts were bar barging around in my skull. We stared into each other's eyes. 
I rolled up the sleeves of my green jacket and slid my arms across the table. That's when he pulled out the cuffs and arrested me right there. <laughs> just like, it's just so great. You know, and he was just doing his job. He's trying to sell, you know, I just think you're great. I'm arresting you. It's just so perfect. Um, and if she hadn't gone to jail, then she wouldn't have ever worked in a bookstore. You know, I mean, that's, that's the other thing that's so wonderful about the book is that it just shows you the, the accidents in life that shift the, the flow of your river into a different place. And, you know, you're just, you become somebody else. Um, yes, Terry. Um, I was just thinking about the universality of a lot of the experiences that were in here. And I remember during the pandemic wondering about people who had new babies, you know, was that a joyful thing? Was that a kind of a saving thing? Or, you know, it could also be a really um, frightening, stressful thing to be trapped uh, at home with the baby um, by yourself. But, and then the notion of older kids like Hedda, the stepdaughter boomeranging home and, um, and how that impact, you know, you could see the, the impact on um, Pollock and Tookie's relationship too. It's just all the dynamics I thought were so interesting. And, um, and what you said, James, at the beginning, I mean, they talked about that being a kindness that he did her by being the one to come arrest her. Um, and I thought that the biggest kindness of the book was the fact that Erdrich didn't make Pollux die at the end. I, I just couldn't have gone on. <laughs> um, so that was a huge gift, I think, to all of us. But um, yeah, just so many interesting, interesting tidbits. And like, you know, the confessional, what a weird, funky, quirky thing to have in their bookstore. And of course, that would be where Flora would hang out. And um, it just had, I mean, there was just so much that's... Uh, hard to know where to begin, but it will definitely, I think, will be one of those that sticks with you for a long time. But the other thing that I was thinking to Corinne's point about all the books that came up um, throughout the novel itself was just how very, and that's this has to be for you guys working in this business, how many books exist in the world. And for people who love to read that, you know, you feel you're just... Um, you know, you're just chipping it away at a tiny, at the edges. yeah, at the edges of what, uh, what's out there. And that, that kind of, um, that feeling kind of permeated the book for me too. It, yeah, I agree. I think that's a great comment. Cause I was going to say to, to you, Corinne, don't ever be apologetic or feel bad about yourself for not having read something. My God. I mean, there are so many things that are, you know, I mean, I, when I think about all the great books that I've never read, uh, all you can do is just find something and read it and pass it on to somebody else. But, and yeah, to your commentary, it, it you know, so many people, when I open the store, you know, you, or over the last 10 years would say things to me like, oh, really, you, I've always wanted to work in a bookstore, or I've always, you know, I mean, people, there's just something about it that may, it's a very, very unusual way to, and you also think you'll be able to read all those books just by working in the bookstore, being in there, that you'll That's suddenly... Good. Yeah, <laughs> a joke. Yeah, you, like, eyes, all you, those can books. Read, you can read less of what you really want to read, you know, be, because you have to keep, you know, we all have to keep reading forward, you know, reading things that are about to come out. Anyway, um, Allison, yeah, yeah, but thanks for, that was all great stuff. Um, a couple of things. Uh, since, you, since you're talking about bookstores, I mean, as you know, I, I worked in a bookstore, <laughs> two different bookstores for two different five-year stints. And I, I think what I, I mean, what I especially loved about this was, I mean, the bookstore becomes a world, it becomes a universe. And every, every bookstore is its own little universe, as you know, well know from working in one. I mean, I just, when I think of what you guys went through, you know, I was one of those people ordering books every week, you know. So it was like, thank God for Arcadia, you know, it's like, you were like a lifeline to us, you know, um, but um, back to the, to, to the book, um, 
I mean, I, I love the, the, the bookstore itself as this whole world. And I was really struck while reading it that in some ways it's like a lot of different books. Cause I mean, it starts out with this kind of body heist, you know, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, you know, there's the ghost and then later on, you know, the stuff with George Floyd, but I mean, that section, both Tom and I, we were, we were really, I mean, it really, that really brought that, it was like we were, I was re-experiencing it again as I was reading it. And I became very depressed while I was reading it. That was and the hard part to read. The hard part, yeah. yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I felt it almost became, I mean, that almost became like creative nonfiction there. You know, it almost became like narrative, I don't know, like, I don't know what, Truman Capote or Norman Mailer or something. It felt so vivid and alive. So I, I, there were like just a lot of different, stories in it and I love the way she wove them together and I I I wondered about you know these short sections that she would write because I thought wow that's probably how she made it manageable for herself to write it you know during this time you know if she was trying to write you know a 30 page chapter or something that would have been unmanageable so yeah. it was just so rich and um yeah, Karen, I had the, I did the same thing. I was I was checking in the margin. Oh, I've got to read that. I've got to read that. I mean, and I usually go and read, you know, the notes at the end of a book first. It's just, just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't believe in doing that, and I do. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I like how she came out of the George Floyd thing a little bit, the the dark part of it, because she talked about the. Um, the circle dance and the jingle dresses and that whole dancing thing and that was just kind of like a a healing thing and yeah. lord we got so much more healing to do but in the book that kind of worked to transition yeah, kind of like, not see. not totally out of the george floyd stuff but it it, it changed that mood a little bit yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I, I agree com completely, Tom. I mean, it was just, um, but that's exactly what she said. She, she, you know, because obviously she started the book in November of, 19, of, of 2019. You know, there was no pandemic. There was no George Floyd. And then as these things were, were happening, I, I think, you know, the two of you are, are right. I mean, she just kept saying to herself, I'm just going to try to tell this through the eyes of my characters. Uh, so that it, you know, so it isn't reportage, but it's personal, you know, and, and so uh, because, the, you know, the, the events were so vivid in and of themselves, and everybody knew them, uh, you know, every, Minneapolis was the world and the world was Minneapolis. So, to, uh, so that, you know, the ways that she stretched out those things and took a character and, uh, and started, you know, they went someplace else where it was so, was so potent and it was a great mood changer, I agree. Oh, and Terry, by the way, Birchbark, Birchbark Books, uh, her bookstore in Minneapolis does have a, a confessional in the, in the bookstore. Um, so it's, uh, and it also has a canoe floating above everything. Mm -hmm. It's a, very, it's a beautiful store. Uh, if you want to see the store, there was a, there's a, yeah, one of the other things you can find on YouTube is an interview with her that was on, um, oh, for Pete's sakes. Oh, the McNeil, I was going to say the McNeil Lair Report, which of course is what it was called 600 years ago when I <laughs> first realized that television existed. But uh, whatever it's now called, uh, but but 60, no, it's not 60 minutes. Whatever, you know what I'm talking about. But but there's a nice about seven minute interview that most of it happens in the bookstore and they show you all of the stuff. But she did go out of her way in this other interview to say, I never named the bookstore because I didn't want our customers coming in and walking up to one of the booksellers and saying, "Are you supposed to be so and so? Are you supposed to be so and so?" Uh, you know, in you know, she just didn't want her her co-mates to uh, to have to deal with that kind of scrutiny. And she said, at least at that time of that interview, it had that had not happened. No one had been trying to decide who was whom. In the um, anyway, um, other other things about. Um, Mike Smith has his hand raised. I will turn my, I should be on now, but I thought one of the other fascinating things was the, uh, well, Pollock's didn't die. The book that got buried didn't die. 
And so we had this book that they tried to kill. And so that was an interesting part of the story for me, too, on top of everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. And then that, and, and what was, there was a sentence in that book that as, you know, might have killed someone, you know, and that's, yeah, that was really, that, you know, there's so many, it's, you know, it's a book you could sort of reread and, and kind of learn a whole different landscape of it, I think. It's, uh, wow. I, yeah, I ended up reading it twice. Well, I read it in November when it first came out because James never shared his um, galley with anybody. So I had to, <laughs> I took one home the day it came out. Um, take, take it, go ahead. Yes, but then I listened to it on Libro, the uh, audio book, which Louise reads. So that was fabulous. So I just did that yesterday, just to remind myself what happened way back in November. All right, Kareen. Do you want to say something? Oh, I, I was just thinking about when you're talking about um, Pollux and and the fact that she started this in 2019, which I didn't know. Um, I got to imagine he was always a retired cop, right? Because that was the how they met. Yeah. But what how important that becomes during the George Floyd section of the book and you know, that it, it creates this rift of him being a former cop and the cops being kind of the enemy in a way. And then him feeling good, like, well, what, I go to that cup foods all the time. What if I had been there? I could have done something. I can't, you know, it, it, it became such a, an important um, weight on them later. And to, th to think that she had no idea that was going to happen yeah. And she created this character who's a former cop and that, you know, it, it's, it's almost, it, it's kind of magical to think that that was an accident yeah. in a way, you know, um, it seems like something that would have been, you know, mapped out in an outline, not something that happened organically. But, um, but that was, that was very, an interesting section I thought too, of how, um, you know, he, and he started, uh, you know, going out into the world and, and, you know, it almost felt like some kind of penance in, in a way. I and, that, I and then he ends up getting COVID from being out there, you know, it's uh, anyway. No, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of penance in the book. I mean, people feeling like, you know, the things we're carrying around that we feel like we ought to somehow do something because of the things we are unhappy about in ourselves. And then, and to go back to Terry's uh, thing about if he hadn't, if as long as he, she was so glad he didn't die, and I, I think, yeah, you, you feel like because think about how that if if he had died, you think about how that might have just destroyed Tookie's life because she had been so unrelenting, just un, she would not give in, you know, and she held on to her anger and frustration for for a long time. And if he had died, then, you know, she would have had no chance to, to take, I mean, that's a lot for someone to carry when she was, you know, when Tookie was already carrying so many other things in her heart and in her head. Um, yeah, uh, I think she, I think it was, um, you know, I think at a certain point, probably when the world went so further off the tracks than probably even a good novelist or a great novelist could have imagined it would have, it probably made her even more protective of her characters. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't let, you know, I can't kill off anybody. It'll be too, too sad, too much. You have your hand up. Oh, we have two hands up. I just had a quick question. I just was curious what everybody thought about Lawrence Jarvis's father. Um, I mean, he just seems like a not simple character. You know, you at different points, you I was tempted to read him one way or, you know, he was going to be and he never um, really allowed himself to be classified in a particular stereotype. He just seems to have um, like like everybody, just a mixed bag of good and bad. Right. And and you know, and, and she said this on many occasions, Louise, 
Erdrich has said it, but um, you know, she 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 really believes that you know writing a part of what writing is really about is is bringing stereotypes into something and then fracturing them you know and 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 dismantling them and so and then making you ask yourself why did i just assume that person was one thing when you know every person's more complicated than that you know and and so i think she she does that intentionally which is great yeah um who else said that? oh there's another yeah um, Barb Jenkin. Yeah, um, for me, this the characters in the they they felt like real people. I mean, you really felt like you were there, or that they were real people there. Like, like she was chronicling real people's lives. You know, with obviously the events that were going on in Minneapolis. Um, and being, you know, a bookstore owner herself, I'm wondering how, what do they call it? Autobiographical fiction, is that the right term? I'm wondering how, how, how much of her was in the book, Louise. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the bookstore owner's name, Louise? Yes. Yeah, well, there it is. I mean, so that really, <laughs> Made me wonder. <laughs> yeah. And when Tukey goes to visit Louise at her house, she talks about her cold floors and all the rugs. I would bet money that Louise Erdrich's real house has cold floors. I think, you know, she's so in this book and, and I'm sure that her booksellers are based on characters in her own story, or the characters are based on like, her, her booksellers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I, like you said, she has all the all the components of the store right. are in the store. In the, in yeah, the well, store. She, she was asked in, in this this long interview um, why she said it in Birch Bark Books. And she smiled and said, I had to write about the only bookstore that I knew, you know, that I really knew. And so it's uh, it. Yeah, it, it's, and I, it's, she's, I'm, am I misremembering? Does she talk at one point in the, in the book when we're at Louise's house? Does she talk about her bathtub and tiles that she writes things on? I can't remember because she told that story about herself and I'll, I'll get to that when we're at the end, but it just, um, yeah, but yeah, it is, it's clearly her and it's, and it, well, I mean, because she was traveling around the country when her aunt, with a, with her tour of the Night Watchman, the book that won the Pulitzer, uh, when and she had to cancel all. Remember that fairly early in the in, or in the in the middle in the when we get to February and March of 2020 in the book, and she's out on the road. She was Louise was out on the road, doing interviews, and she did a she did one in Kansas at a famous bookstore in in Lawrence, and then right after that canceled the whole rest of the tour and that part of that is in the book um it's um yeah so it yeah it's kind of auto fiction in that way i guess but i think she's just you know she's she's allowing it i mean one of the reasons i think the book works so well is because of her particular knowledge about that world um it's really something uh, other comments? Yep, Darlene. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Your name? Yes. Oh, Charlotte. Yes, Charlotte. I I did think that it was very interesting how she, Louise. Uh, the writer portrayed herself, Louise, the real person and real book owner. And there are always those moments um, where there would be something like, well, Louise sent out a memo and it was during the pa pandemic and what she did, well, she was trying to be cheerful, but it had the exact opposite. And so there, I thought I, one would think that those kinds of insertions were probably true, were probably true, how, how she, 
um, perceived herself acting in that particular moment. And I thought it was, um, she was always, um, whenever she was portrayed, it was always with a little bit of self-deprecation and a lot of humor. And I thought that was, that was, was enjoyable and probably gives us a little insight into her as a character herself. Yeah, agree, agree. Wow. Um, I know, I'm glad that uh, there were probably times in the book where I thought, oh, I wish I'd thought of doing that. You know, I should have done that to make people feel better or make people laugh or something. Um, we were all just sort of in panic mode. Um, other other thoughts? You know, every I, I just have one thing about dictionaries. I've, I've sort of, thanks to John McPhee's book about writing and, and his comments about dictionaries and listening to Louise talk tonight, I feel like, you know, I, maybe I'll just spend a year just reading the dictionary. You know, just really, because she said a thing about the dictionary that's exactly like a bookstore, which is you go to look up a word in the, in the dictionary and the, the rest of the page is filled with words you've never heard before and you don't know anything about them. And that's what's so great about a bookstore. You know, it's just, there's all this stuff just kind of sitting around and you're going, what is that? And pretty soon you've walked home with four books and we can stay open uh, instead of the one you were going to buy. But, um, but I think that's the, you know, the, the sort of miracle of, of language is that, you know, if it was so brilliant for that, for her old teacher to send her a dictionary, because it, you know, it, it, I mean, part of you thinks a dictionary, but then you think, yeah, a dictionary, because everything's in there. <laughs> And everything that's in there will lead you to a million other things. It's, it's just really, really great. Wow. Um, anybody else? Oh, Larry? I really like the part where Dissatisfaction read a book that transformed him into an optimist and then she called him Satisfaction. <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. But I'd like to just read another quick part that has two of my favorite sentences in the book, one about the former president and one about cats. In the rest of the world, things did not calm down. Things continued to falter. By sheer repetition, our highest elected official was wearing false grooves into people's brains that they interpreted as truth. Portland protesters were grabbed off the street by anonymous officers, thrown in vans for questioning. It was learned that cats live in a state of chronic schizophrenia. There was this sense as we approached fall in the election that we were traveling down a steep slope toward an unknown fate. Maybe there would be relief or maybe things would get worse. But the line about the former president, that's brilliant political analysis. And uh, my cat enjoyed the line about cats having chronic schizophrenia. <laughs> well, I, I have no comment about that, Larry. I, 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 whatever you do to your cat, you know, that's the poor cat. That's all I can say. Um, other, com oh, oh it's, it's getting late. Other comments? Okay. Okay. Well, thank oh, you, what? everybody. Oh, yes. Are you going to say something, Jane? Oh, no, I just thought since Larry was reading a couple things, I was just going to ask if I could read a couple of the things that I really loved. Of course. Um, page 183, when she's talking about the baby, and somebody mentioned earlier about the way she bonded with the baby, and she says, um, when a baby falls asleep in your arms, you are absolved. The purest creature alive has chosen you. There's nothing else. I mean, I just thought that was such a beautiful expression of, yeah. you know, a feeling that I would not have otherwise known how to express, but um, have certainly felt. And then the other one on page 189, when she's talking about the bookstore, 
which I'm sure, um, you know, Nancy and James, you'll love this one. She, um, talking about Louise, she had this weird sense of destiny about the store. It was more than a place. It was a nexus, a mission, a work of art, a calling, a sacred craziness, a slice of eccentricity, a collection of good people who shifted and rearranged, but cared deeply about the same one thing, books. Yeah. Amen. Um, the uh, any other any other final comments? Oh, those were really great, and it is that is yeah. There is something even more po. I mean, I've hung around bookstores my whole life. Probably, uh, I spent more hours in bookstores than I've spent in rehearsal rooms, which seems impossible, but I think it's true. But uh, it's, uh, they're two really wonderful places to be. Um, so at the end of this thing the, from the Newbury Library, th they were taking questions for her from the audience or from you know the people on Zoom. And one young student asked her <laughs> if she had a particular poem that she loved that, uh, that really influenced her. And she kind of talked about a lot of poems that she loved with, that she read with her father when she was young and, and, and she didn't, but then, but then she had four other questions that were asked. And in, I think in all four questions, she ended up then talking about a particular poem that she, that was now coming into her head and, and that she wanted to share, one of which was, uh, it's a, a fa favorite Neruda poem of mine too, called Ode to My Socks. So if you've, if you've never read uh, Pablo Neruda's poem, Ode to My Socks, uh, it's, it's just insane. But, but then at the very end, she said, oh, I have this short poem that I memorized years ago by, by Langston Hughes. And she said, and so I really need to say it out loud. And so here's the poem. Sometimes a crumb falls from the tables of joy. Sometimes a bone is flung. To some people, love is given. To others, only heaven. And that's the whole poem. And, you know, it was just, she said, I've, I have that poem sort of tattooed on me. She said, I've just, it's always been in me. Uh, it was a great way to, you know, to say to a student, you know, let all that stuff in. It's um, really great. Um, any last comments? Hi, Julie. Um, nothing else? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was a really special book. So thank you for joining us today. Um, so next month, um, our book club will be on Wednesday, March 16th at 6 p.m. And we're going to talk about Lost and Found by Catherine Schultz. James wrote, I can never tell which way to do this. James wrote about this a couple of weeks ago in the newsletter. Um, this is a memoir about, um, is, is, she, is she a writer, James? She's lost yeah. her father. Yeah, she's she's a, a writer for the New Yorker. Uh, she she wrote that famous. Uh, in fact, I was going to put this in the newsletter, and then I couldn't get it in in any way. But she wrote a piece in 2015 that won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for reporting, which was about the the imminent earthquake in the, in Seattle and and Portland. And my wife Helen has, has always wanted to move to that part of the country. Now she won't even go there. Period. She won't go there even for a minute because she's so convinced that she'll be there when the tidal wave wipes out both of those cities. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a book about about her the death of her father, which is the lost part. And, uh, and her falling in love with Casey Sepp, who's a, a, also a New Yorker writer and a, 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 a reporter. And the, the two women have now have a five month old uh, baby, but they're, um, it's, it, it's just, a, and it kind of started with a, with a thing she wrote because she found, she, she found herself saying, 10 days after her father died, something she'd never said before. I, I lost my father last week. And, and because she's a reporter and an essayist, what she's that letter to the sort of history of the word lost 
and uh, and then what's really amazing, the third section of the book is is about the ampersand and, uh, which which one of the amazing things in the book is uh, until about 1890, the, the ampersand or, or the word and was the 27th letter in the English alphabet. Who knew? So that so the book is filled with all of this wonderful arcania, so profoundly about sea of loss and the potency or finding something, finding love in her case, and how the and really means that we always experience life with both things happening simultaneously. It's, I just think it's a beautiful book. Now, I, I think some people will say, oh, you know, in the section where she's writing about falling in love, it's all goony-eyed. But I just feel like it's the whole thing is, is just really beautiful. I know Terry Bruzo's read it, and she, she really loved it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. I mean, it, it, it would be a, give us a lot to talk about, whether you like it or not. Like it or not, you're going to have a lot to talk about. So, <laughs> Okay. That's... All I have to say, Kate, is that Kate up there in the corner, in my corner? No. Darkness out here, yeah. You never spoke the whole time. What's going on? Are you all right? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. Okay, all right, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, you were sitting in the dark and you never said a word. So I thought, uh oh, that's not good. It's um, freezing in here. Okay. This house has no insulation and I'm so cold, I can't even speak. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so it's just a practical thing. I see. Okay. Good. Right. Cold here too. I have a blanket on my lap, like old man Potter, because it's chilly in this office. <laughs> oh yeah, old man Potter. <laughs> oh, Potter. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. <laughs>